Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Mark McDermott, and I'm going to talk about the title of my talk tonight is Fighting for Our Democracy, Learning from Our Ancestors. In the last two and a half years, I've done 140 speeches and workshops from San Diego to Vancouver, British Columbia, to Miami, Florida, to Pittsburgh, Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and other places, talking to audiences, a lot of unions, but also a lot of community-based organizations and faith-based organizations about uh, the American dream being stolen from working people and our, and our democracy being stolen from us, how this has happened, and what can we do about it. So this is a continuation of that discussion. Why, why am I doing this? Um, I started out uh, when I was 12 years old. Uh, my father lost his job. He was 56. He never got another job. We plunged into deep poverty. Uh, I ended up living in the garage for three years when I was in high school. I know what it's like to live, in a, uh, live and sleep in a room that has no heat when it's zero degrees out. Uh, and I wanted to go to college desperately, and my parents had absolutely no money. And unbeknownst to me, my high school guidance <coughs> counselor, and this was not required of her, she started giving my high school transcript to college recruiters that were coming through. And one day, out of the blue, I got a letter from a small college in Illinois that told me if I fill out this application, they'll give me a free ride for four years to go to their college. This was a public employee who did this for me. This was a public school teacher who did this for me. This was someone who did not have to do it, and it changed my life forever. And the opportunity that I was given, as I've gone through life, I came to understand that the financial aid that I got mainly came from federal programs that were a result of the struggles of the Civil Rights Movement and other people who were fighting to open up higher education to poor kids regardless of the color of their skin. So I stand before you as a middle-aged white guy who benefited directly from the Civil Rights Movement. I've never forgotten it. And it sort of led me to a belief that I want to make sure that every kid in this country, I don't care who they are, I don't care where they came from, what religion they believe in or do not believe in, they're gay or straight, native-born or foreign-born, that every kid in this country ought to get an opportunity to be able to reach for their dreams and for it to be real. And what I see is that dream is being systematically stolen from them. And I'm going to do everything I can, and I'm talking to everybody I know. We can't let our young people have their dreams stolen from them so that they can't be who they want to be in a society that is fair and just. So that's who I am. But I want to find out a little bit about you before we get started. And I want to ask you a series of questions about you, your family members, that's your extended family, your close friends, and their extended families. Okay? And if the answer to the question is yes, I'd like you to raise your hand. In the past six years, do you know anybody who's worried about their job or finding a full-time, good-paying job? Everybody. Uh, struggling to pay the bills or paying for health care? For in that extended family or the extended families of your friends? Virtually everybody. Difficulties in paying for college or large student loans? Just about everybody. Young people struggling to start good careers? Everybody. Underwater mortgage, foreclosures or evictions? Probably two-thirds of you. And last but not least, worried about adequate income in retirement? Everybody. Just about everybody. There's something profoundly wrong here, sisters and brothers, that in the wealthiest country in the world, this is the kind of response, and this is a typical response in virtually every presentation and speech I do. So I want to ask you another question. Do you feel like your government is more concerned about you and your welfare and the, and the welfare of your family or the wealthy and the powerful? FCC had a decision today. Okay, that, you're off topic, but thank you. So the question is, does anybody, does anybody feel like the government cares more about you and them. Okay? Okay. So let me ask you this question. Do you want to take our government back so that it's once again a government of, by, and for the people? Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's talk about what can, we, what can we learn from the past that's relevant to the situation that we face, because we're not the first generation that's had to deal with these kinds of situations. Famous quote from George Santayana, who once said, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat their mistakes. So to me, it is critical that we understand where we came from, how what is good in America came to be, and how it's being taken away from us. And the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King once said, 
The labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. It was not the titans of industry. Okay? It was people like us who built the American dream. It's being stolen from us, and we need to figure out how to take it back. So let's go back at a time machine to 1886. Won't use many of the slides up here, but that's okay. In 1886, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in uh, Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa Clara County that corporations were legal persons, and they were, in, they were endowed with constitutional rights. Okay? Foundational moment. A lot of people know this now. In 1888, President Grover Cleveland in the State of the Union Address is quoted as saying, Corporations which should be the carefully restrained creatures of the law and servants of the people are fast becoming the people's masters. So I ask you to imagine for a second, 126 years later, any president of the United States getting up in the State of the Union Address and saying that corporations are out of control and we need to get them back under control and make them our servants rather than our masters. It's almost inconceivable that this would happen, but that was being said back in the old days. So I want to introduce you to my grandparents. My Irish American grandfather went to work when he was 10 years old, got pulled out of third grade. My German American grandfather got pulled out of sixth grade, went to work at age 12. It was a non-union America, wages extremely low, and their parents could not make enough money to put a roof over their head and put enough food on the table without their children being forced to go to work. Their childhoods were stolen from them and their dreams for what they were hoping in their lives were going to be much smaller because they couldn't make enough to support themselves. There's a famous quote from the uh, founder of Coca-Cola and every time you drink a can of Coca-Cola I urge you to remember this quote. The most beautiful sight that we see is a child at labor. As early as he may get at labor the more beautiful, the more useful does his life get to be. I'm not making up this quote. This is what Mr. Candler said. Now, Mr. Candler wasn't talking about his kids, the children of the super wealthy. He's talking about the working class kids and the poor kids, and that as soon as you can put them to work in a mine or a mill or a smelter or picking cotton, that's what you should have them do. So that what is going to happen to them, their future, is going to be much more limited, okay? And there was an enormous fight in the country over whether or not we should ban child labor. It was, a, it was a foundational fight that went on for decades. But the problem was, if you're making so little money and you say, I'm not gonna send my kids to work, you may not have enough money to put food on the table and a roof over your head. So working people, tens of millions of them, were literally caught in a trap we want our kids to get an education, but we need money, and we need food, and we need a roof over our head. So let's go to the depression of, 18, of the 1890s. It's the worst depression in American history. And workers are desperately fighting back as wages are being cut, in some cases 20, 25 percent from wages that were like 30, 35 cents an hour. And the Army and the National Guard was repeatedly, repeatedly brought in to break strikes and continue to beat workers down and working, working class people and the communities in which they lived. It was a desperate, desperate situation. There's no unemployment insurance, there's no public assistance, there's no food stamps, there's no Medicaid, there's no Medicare. There is nothing except being on the edge of starvation, hunger, and cold. So, but the people didn't take this lying down. So, all sorts of organizing is going on across the country and they start hammering on Congress. And they demand that Congress pass a federal income tax and the revenues can be used to help the struggling people. So in 1894, there was enough pressure on Congress that they actually passed um, a federal income tax. It was a 2% flat tax. It only applied to the richest 10% of families. And it's this huge victory for working people. It's like oh my God, there's actually going to be more revenues and maybe we're going to get some help to survive this desperate depression. So what happens? The corporate dominated Supreme Court steps in and declares the income tax unconstitutional. Bang. End of story. Okay, so we're back to ground zero. So the elections of 1896 approach. And on the one hand, you have a guy named William McKinley who is the 
advocate and tool of the robber barons, of the super wealthy and the corporate elites. And on the other hand, you have a guy named William Jennings Bryan, who's the champion of working people and the farmers and the poor folks. And this is a titanic and critically important election. And Bryan, in his famous speech in 1896, 1896 said, you shall not crucify humanity on a cross of gold. And he was basically holding up that the big money men, as they were called in those days, are strangling the country and we're living in true desperation. So the election approaches and, and the corporate elites and, cor and the, the super wealthy say we have got to win this election and we're going to win it with money. Okay? They, McKinley outspends Bryan 11 to 1. 11 to 1. If you think we've had trouble in the current elections with too much money, imagine your side being outspent 11 to 1. McKinley wins the popular vote 53 to 46 percent. It's a relatively narrow win. If he had only had twice as much money as Bryan, or three times as much money as Bryan, the people's champion might have won. Okay? But they went all out and said, how much money do you need? We're going to give you everything that you need. And of course, this is completely legal because there are no federal laws that limit campaign contributions or maximum contributions or anything. Corporations can give money, anybody can give money, and you can pull a million, you know, half a million dollars out of your wallet and just hand it over and say, here we go. Okay? So we lose this election. So the president in Congress remains in, in the stranglehold of corporate power. And at the same time, there are strikes going on all over the country fighting against child labor, among other things, and trying to shorten the work week. One of them was in 1903 in Philadelphia. 100,000 workers go on strike. They want a 55-hour work week. They're working 60 hours a week. And one-sixth one of all the people on strike are children. And, and the picket signs that they had is, we want to go to school. Well, their parents are making so little money that their parents can't let them go to school because they need to be putting money on the table for a roof over their head and for food. The strike is broken after eight weeks. They have no strike fund. They're starved into submission. There is a children's march from Philadelphia to Long Island to the summer home of President Teddy Roosevelt saying, do something. And he basically told them to go home and get back in line. Okay? Another bitter defeat. And there were many bitter defeats. But the people didn't give up. Our ancestors didn't give up because they were fighting for their children. They were fighting for their grandchildren, and they were fighting not only for the present, but for a better future and a more hopeful one. By 1907, people and organizations all over the country had put so much pressure on Congress that Congress was forced to pass the Tillman Act, which was the first federal legislation that banned contributions by corporations. So despite the elections being stolen, they put so much pressure on Congress that the people had a huge win. Okay? And six years later, because of the mass pressure from all over the country, we got a U.S. constitutional amendment that authorized Congress to have a personal income tax, and it only applied to the richest 2% of American families. They said it couldn't be done, and our ancestors did this. The same year, after years of organizing, they also pushed through a constitutional amendment that called for direct elections of U.S. Senators. Okay? Because previously, they'd been elected by the legislatures, and a lot of the legislatures had been bought, sold, and paid for by corporate power. So three huge victories that expanded our democracy, despite the fact that corporations were still dominant economically. So one of the big fights at the same time was bust up the big corporations. They were called the trusts. And they were strangle, literally strangling the country. And there, you, can, you can look at the literature of the time and you see Standard Oil, which was the biggest of the big, this is the Rockefeller people, is an octopus that is strangling the entire country. Okay? So the fight was now, we've got to break up the corporations, we've got to limit their ability to contribute money. We want to limit the amount of money that the wealthy can put into elections because we're trying to 
take our democracy back because it, it was supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people. And we wanted the government to affirmatively act and do things like ban child labor, make the right to organize unions important and legal so that we could raise the standard of living so our kids could be able to go to school and not be forced to work out of economic hardship and desperation. So while we're winning some of these major struggles to expand our democracy, at the same time, there is a counterattack, and one of the big counterattacks is in the South. And a lot of blacks and a lot of whites start joining together. This is the end of the 19th century. And they build coalitions, and in some states, they actually elect coalition governments that start to work on behalf of the people. And this is a direct quote. We wrested our state government from Negro supremacy. Really, wrested? our state government from Negro supremacy. Do you know what this means? This means that a bunch of whites and a bunch of blacks got together and voted and elected some black folks into office along with some white folks and they're working together and they're starting to improve and make better laws that serve the people. Okay? The ruling elites down there working with hardcore racists said we're not going to allow this. So they began the counterattack to take the right to vote away with uh, uh, literacy tests with poll taxes and other kinds of techniques. And in Mississippi alone, between, in 1876, 70% of the eligible voters voted, and by 1920, it was less than 10%. They had virtually taken the right to vote away from all black folk, and the vast majority of the white working class and poor white farmers were also disenfranchised, even though the U.S. Constitution says that at that point, every male has a right to vote unless you've been convicted of a felony, okay? So, they're, they're, starting, to, they're, starting, to take the, they're starting to take the democracy away in certain parts of the country based on racism and also class interests. At the same time, we're winning some other fights to expand the democracy, so it's, it, it's a mixed report. In other states, we're fighting at the state level and we're winning the right to get an initiative. We're getting the right for a referendum because we want to have an ability to go directly to the people to change the laws because in too many cases, the legislatures are bought, sold, and paid for by corporate interests. So the struggle for democracy is it, to expand our democracy and really have our government serve the people is very complicated and made much more difficult by taking the right to vote away. Okay? What is another issue that's going on, obviously, is women's right to vote. This is not new information, I'm sure, to anybody in this room. In 1913, 5,000 women marched through the streets of Washington, D.C., demanding the right to vote. They were attacked by angry mobs. A hundred of them were beaten so badly they were hospitalized, and they had to bring the U.S. Army out to restore order so that they could continue to exercise their constitutional rights of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And so the fight for the women's right to vote was also not just people standing around and saying, why don't you do the right thing here? People suffered. In every one of these areas, people were fighting and struggling, saying, we want a government that is of, by, and for the people and not of, by, and for the corporations. Okay? So let's go back to the fight over child labor. This, this story is not finished, okay? At the same time folks are fighting to ban child labor, so make it illegal, and to try and raise wages so our kids can have a brighter future, the fight is on to have free, mandatory public education. Free, this is an important word, not you have to pay for it, which was a revolutionary idea, is that you should have free public education. It took until 1918 to finally have every state have free mandatory public education. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't of equal quality because you've got separate but equal. Blacks and poor whites are going to get inferior educations to the children of the well-to-do and the middle classes, but at least we were winning that fight. Okay? So let's go back to child labor again. The struggle continues and the organizing continues across the country. We get to 1918 and we hammer on, our ancestors hammer on Congress to the point 
that in 1918, Congress passes the first federal law banning child labor in dangerous industries and starting to get the kids out of schools. And guess what happens? <laughs> the corporate-dominated U.S. Supreme Court declares it unconstitutional, and it's struck down. It's struck down. Okay? Our ancestors didn't take it lying down. They reorganized. They put the big fight on. They pushed another uh, a law through Congress, uh, banning child labor in, in non-agricultural industries in 1923. And lo and behold, what happens? The corporate-dominated U.S. Supreme Court steps in and declares it unconstitutional. Okay, So you've got all these laws that say that you're supposed to be going to school, but you can't get a law passed that says uh, kids, it's illegal for them to be working during school hours. Okay? And if your parents are desperate and don't have enough money, a lot of them are going to continue to go to school. Okay? Fast forward to the 1930s. The greatest upheaval in American history where working people and community allies stood up and built a powerful labor movement and began demanding fundamental changes in the country in the worst hard times that our country has ever seen economically. In 1938, after 90 years of fighting and struggle, we finally got the Congress to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act, which banned child labor in most non-agricultural industries where it was dangerous, and the primary emphasis was on going to school. Okay? I forgot to mention one thing here. They tried to get a constitutional amendment for child labor laws. Okay? They managed to get it through Congress, and they got it, they sent it out to the states. It only passed in 28 out of the 36 states that were required to ratify that constitutional amendment. And you know where that failed? It failed in the states where they had been systematically taking the right to vote away from black folk and poor white working class and farmers. Okay? And if you look at the map, where they were systematically stripping away the right to vote, were the states that systematically said, we are not going to ratify a constitution, constitutional amendment that says Congress has the authority to pass child labor laws to protect our children and make sure that they have a brighter future. I got a little out of order here. <coughs> Duh. So after that, it took the great upheaval of the 1930s. And when Congress passes, finally passes the child labor law protections inside of the Fair Labor Standards Act, guess what? The Supreme Court decides, without one word changed in the U.S. Constitution, that it was constitutional. Okay? And the reason they did it was because we had built enough political power that we had elected presidents who had nominated people to the U.S. Supreme Court who actually wanted to serve the interests of the people and have a government of, by, and for the people. They read the ex exact same document, document and came to a different conclusion. Okay? So in some cases, yes, we want constitutional amendments, but by God, we better build a political power so we can put people in the Supreme Court who will read that document as if it is actually about a government of, by, and for the people and uh, uh, not of, by, and for corporate power. Okay? This was a 90-year struggle and repeated efforts, repeated efforts, and repeated efforts, and finally, we have the great breakthrough. And when, and when my father was old, he, he died at age 93, and I, and I asked him, probably in his mid-80s, I asked him, I said, what was, what was your grandfather's, what was my grandfather's, what were his proudest moments? You know, this is a guy who was third grade educated, worked from ages 10 to 75. And my dad got teary-eyed, you know, and this was like really unusual. And I said, so what, what was it? And he said, uh, the day I graduated from high school, the day I walked across the stage, and I got a high school diploma because my grandfather said, my top priority is to make sure that my children get educated. And for them, for them, that meant to get a high school diploma. And my father and mother were the first people in the entire history of our families, going back till Adam and Eve or wherever that thing started, who actually got a high school diploma. And that their political activism was being driven in part by they wanted a better future for their kids and their grandkids and children 
yet to be born, and they weren't going to shut up and weren't going to give up no matter how many times they lost, no matter how many times they got beat down, because they didn't want to say to their children or their grandchildren, the future looks pretty bad and there's nothing we can do. Okay? And we need to draw on this rich history to understand that people like us in the past, when hard times have been upon us and, and it feels like the corporations were stepping on our throats, that people like us came together, organized, and kept coming despite defeat after defeat after defeat until they finally won. Okay? So let's fast forward, let's get in the time machine and fast forward to the 1970s when we're you know, having several decades of relative prosperity, the, the greatest and broadest prosperity we've ever had in this country. Not that it was perfect. People of color were still trailing whites. Women were still trailing men. But at least the future was looking brighter and better. Okay? And we won all these victories in the 1930s. We won all these victories in the 1960s. And we were broadening our democracy and broadening economic opportunity and educational opportunities for more and more people, myself included. And I'm certainly not the only poor kid who got a chance to reach for their dreams because people stood up and said, shouldn't we have a chance to go to college even if my father doesn't have a dime to help? Even though he'd worked most of his life until really hard times came upon him. Okay? So, how many of you have ever heard of Lewis Powell? Okay, a few of you. Who is Lewis Powell? Lewis Powell was the former president of the American Bar Association. He served on the boards of 11 major U.S. corporations. And on August 23, 1971, he wrote a secret memo to a friend of his at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It's called The Attack on the Free Enterprise System. It's a 14-page document. I urge you to Google this and read it. Because if you're concerned about what is happening in America, you've got to read this document. I consider it the most important piece of political writing in the last 50 years. And what he lays out in this memo, secret memo, is the strategy by which corporate America can reassert its dominance over the economic and political life of the country. Okay. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not some kind of wing nut who makes this stuff up. This guy really existed. He really did write it. And two months after he wrote it, while it was still secret, President Nixon appointed him to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he served for 16 years. And he was one of the architects of the landmark Supreme Court decisions that said that free speech is equal to money, which lays the foundations for the struggles that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So what does he say in this memo? He says, we need a decades-long strategy to reassert domination. We need to win the war of big ideas. We need to build a national idea machine, those are my words, but fund think tanks, fund endowed chairs in the universities, attack our enemies in the universities who disagree with us, use the corporate owned media, which by the way we own, to our great advantage, and we need to go on a relentless attack against our economic and political enemies that are restricting our ability to dominate the country. And that only included organized labor, but it's the environmentalists, it's seniors, it's students, it's women who are saying you shouldn't be able to discriminate against us in employment, it's people of color who are doing the same thing, it's all of the movements of the 60s and 70s that are saying, hey, wait a minute, we should have more control in what goes on here, and by the way, don't pollute the environment and destroy the world in which we're trying to live, okay? And the environmental victories and the movement pushed him and other corporate leaders to say, hey, we got we to get in gear here because this is really going to cost us dearly. So what happens in the next few years? There's all these think tanks are created, Heritage Foundation, Manhattan Institute, probably heard of some of these outfits. They increased the number of corporate lobbyists from 1,000 to 10,000 in 10 years in Washington, D.C. They muscle up and say, we're going to go to serious work and we're going to make sure that we're going to pour unlimited amounts of money into elections and we do not want restrictions on our ability to buy elections. Okay. They had a grand strategy. I'm not making this up. So let me read you a quote from 1975. The Trilateral Commission, which is a group of leading uh, uh, corporate leaders from Western Europe, North America, and Japan, come together 
and they have a series of discussions because they believe there's a crisis in democracy. In fact, that's the title of their final report. And the crisis of democracy was there is too much democracy. There are too many people getting involved in trying to influence government, and it's not working to our benefit. And one of the famous quotes from this final report is, the effective operation of a democratic political system usually requires some measure of apathy and non-involvement on the part of some individuals and groups. Let me repeat. Requires some measure of apathy and non-involvement of some individuals and groups. Now, who do we think they're talking about? They're not talking about themselves. They're talking about people like us to either convince us that it doesn't make any difference to get involved. Oh, like what difference does it make? They're all the same. Or to make it more difficult to vote so that they can maximize their influence. And if you doubt this, Paul Weirich, who is the co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, which was one of the think tanks created after the Powell memo, this is a direct quote from 1980. I don't want everybody to vote. Our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Sisters and brothers, I'm talking about people and institutions that are powerful who actually want to systematically dismantle the essence of our democracy, the essence of government of, by, and for the people. Okay? T trying to take us back to the kind of domination that we had in the youth of my grandparents in the 1890s in the early 20th century. Let's fast forward to 2006. I assume everybody's heard of Warren Buffett, right? Yeah? Got to say yes. Okay, good. This is his quote from 2006. There's class warfare, all right, but it's my class, the rich class, is making war and we're winning. That's the direct quote from Warren Buffett. He's not kidding around here. He's calling it like it is. So to use an example of this, I have two dear friends. One is named Sheldon and one is named Miriam. They're the Adelsons from Las Vegas. They are casino owners. They're worth $15 billion. I don't know them that well, actually. I've been in one of their casinos, and I put some money on a slot machine. It's actually a limited friendship. They donated $90 million of their own money in the 2012 election. And according to the decisions from the Supreme Court, one of them called Citizens United and another one this year called McCutcheon, everyone in this room has a constitutional right to donate $90 million of your own money in the next election. Okay? We are all equal that way. Now, if you choose not to do that, that's your business. I'm not telling you how to live your lives. Okay? But we're all equal according to a new corporate-dominated Supreme Court that says that money is equal to free speech and any limits on the ability to give money in elections is taking away the free speech of the people. Okay? And those decisions effectively repealed the 1907 Tillman Act that I mentioned earlier that was a result of the great fight of our ancestors over a hundred years ago to try and get big money out of elections. They went back 103 years and basically overturned that decision. Okay? because they want to get back to the good old days, at least the good old days, for themselves. Now another piece of this is, I call this, if you can't get them to vote right, don't let them vote. Okay, this is a, this is a different method. It's called voter suppression, and they were using that back in the early 20th century, but they were lynching black folks, they were murdering people who were attempting to vote. They're not using those tactics now, but they're making it more difficult for people to vote with voter ID laws and various other techniques that are being used now that the Supreme Court is starting to say to some extent are legal. Now the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was passed in response to a century of systematically denying black folk the right to vote, right, they put a provision in there that said for the states that had a long history of, of discrimination in voting laws, they had to get prior approval from the Department of Justice in order to make changes to their voting laws. This was sort of like we're putting you on permanent probation because you've had a hundred years of being a bad actor, okay? Between 1982 and 2006, that's only 24 years, the Department of Justice turned down over 700 requests from states and municipalities to change their laws because they were said they were discriminatory 
and they were going to limit people's right to vote. Okay? 700. And in 2006, when the Voting Rights Act was renewed, and they kept that clause in place, the Republican-controlled House, and this is the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, said a majority of these proposed changes were calculated decisions to keep minority voters from fully participating in the political process. 700, okay? And last year, the Supreme Court went in and struck down that provision of the Voting Rights Act because, because they said it's not necessary anymore because we don't have the problem anymore. And now a lot of, these, a lot of states are going at it full tilt going in, trying to figure out a way to take the right to vote away. It's a slicker method. It's not murdering people and lynching them and shooting them in the alley like they were doing 100 years ago, but it is the same deliberate attempt. So they're trying to do it you know, by uh, uh, buying the elections. They're trying to do it by taking the right to vote away. And these are exactly the same methods that were being used 100 years ago. And our ancestors stood up and said, no, we're going to keep coming and we're not going to let you do this, okay? So let's fast forward again to, well, how are our kids doing, you know? Because education is, is critical, right? It's critical now. Our kids today are a trillion bucks in the hole with their student debt, and it's gone up 400% in the last 10 years, right? Well, it's a different version of, of making it difficult for kids to be able to get an education 100 years ago when they couldn't get child labor laws through and they made it difficult to get mandatory free public education. Now when you need more education and training to be able to get a decent job, hopefully, they're making it more and more difficult for the kids whose parents do not have money to do this. Okay? So they're playing the same game again. It looks differently. It's not the child labor fight per se, but it is restricting those opportunities for our kids. And the question is, are we going to let them do it? And I say to every audience, we all have a choice here on whether or not we're going to stand up and fight this or let what corporate America did to us 100 years ago try and do it again to us now. Okay. Well, Frederick Douglass, who's one of my great heroes, said in 1857, if there is no struggle, there can be no progress. Find out what any people will quietly submit to and you will have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. Okay? He said that in 1857. He said that right after the Supreme Court. I keep going back to these nine guys. Now well, there's a couple of women now. But back then they were all white guys. They had just issued the Dred Scott decision, which was probably the worst decision in the history of the United States. The Dred Scott decision said if you are an escaped slave who's living in a free state in the north, slavers from the south can come and grab that person and drag them back into slavery in the south. And anybody in the north who is aiding and abetting that escaped slave can go to prison with a felony because they're aiding and abetting stolen, the stealing of property. Okay. And Frederick Douglass stands up and says this after that decision. We'll talk about a bad day for black folk and a bad day for the American people and a bad day for our democracy when our Supreme Court can reach that kind of a conclusion. And he stands up and says, look, they're going to keep doing this to us until we make them stop. And I would say that Brother Douglass was right in 1857. His words are every bit as true today as they were 157 years ago. And if we don't stand up and don't get better organized and reach out to our families and our friends and into our communities and say, hey, look where the future is headed, folks. And if we don't stand together, we have got a pretty good idea that the future may not be heading in a direction that we really want to live into. Okay? But the point of looking at history is to say our ancestors went through harder times than we're going through. They did not give up. They didn't give up because they loved their kids and their grandkids and the young people that they knew and the people in their communities and said, we can't give up because if we do, then we got to go home and tell the people that we love that the future looks pretty grim and there's nothing we can do and sorry about that. 
And I've, I have yet to talk to anybody who wants to go home and have that conversation with the young people that they know and care about. Is anybody here willing to go home and have that conversation with the people, young people you know? Raise your hand. Okay, well, this is the 140th audience that no one's been willing to volunteer that. I didn't raise it high enough. Okay, okay, well. I think you've got to be honest with your children. And to not have the conversation that you're talking about is being very dishonest. Well, my, my, point, my point is I'm not going home to tell my kids that we can't turn this around. I refuse to accept that, because if I accept it, why bother to pay attention? So as I'm going around and talking to folks, people accuse me of Prozac lectures. And they go, Reverend Lang, what did you bring this guy here for? This is so depressing. I mean, I may have to go get some Prozac or something, because I don't think I can handle five more minutes to listen to this guy's depressing story. Okay? Well, the story is not depressing, because our ancestors went through hard times and kept coming and eventually won, and we're in hard times, and I say we need, we need to find inspiration and courage from our ancestors to go, if they could do it, if my third grade and sixth grade educated grandparents could stand up and not back down and keep at it, I say we can do the same. We are standing on their shoulders, and we have got to help our young people move toward a better world. So let me give you some examples of some wins that are going on around here across the country that don't get a lot of news. There's systematic attacks on unions across the country. In Oregon, big business down there tried to push through an initiative to basically break down the unions even farther. They built a huge labor community coalition and they told the business community in Oregon, if you try this, we're going to put three initiatives on the ballot and we're going to come straight at you and corporate Oregon backed down and pulled it off the table. Okay? Same thing happened in Ohio where they took collective bargaining rights away from public employees. They just walked in, they had virtually no discussion in the legislature, and they took away rights that people had had for decades. Organized labor and their community allies, faith community, young people, old people, came together, put an initiative on the ballot. They needed 400,000 signatures, they got a million all-time record in the state of Ohio, and they went to the polls and, and won back those rights that were stolen from them by a legislature and a governor that is bought, sold, and paid for by corporate interests in the state of Ohio. Okay. They said it couldn't be done, and they did it. We got the $15 an hour minimum wage fight going on in our city as we speak. Okay. It is long overdue for people to be able to make enough money if they got a full-time job to not be in poverty. And they said it couldn't be done. We won it just down there in SeaTac a few months ago. And we're going to win another major victory here in the city. And this minimum wage fight is an example of people coming together and saying, we're going to start to take our country back, and we're going to start to take our government back. In California, they pushed through a $10 an hour minimum wage in 2013. Three million people are going to get a raise in the state of California. Said it couldn't be done. And they did it, and young people were a critical part of the fight down there. How many of you have heard about the Moral Monday marches in North Carolina? Raise your hands. One of you. Okay. On February 8th of this year, 50,000 people participated in a demonstration in March in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay, 50,000. That was five with four zeros after it. Okay. And what are they fighting about? They've passed the worst law in the country, taking voting rights away. They kicked 190,000 people off of unemployment insurance who were unable to find work. They denied health care through Medicaid expansion for 500,000 people. They kicked 30,000 ch poor children off of Head Start programs there. They are jacking up the tuition, making it more and more difficult for working class and poor kids to go to college, and the people in North Carolina are saying, hey, we're not going to take this anymore, and they have the biggest demonstration in the history of the South probably in at least 40 years. And in Asheville, North Carolina, I think it was last December, which is in the Appalachian foothills, they had a march of 10,000 people in a city of 250,000. How many of you heard about that one? Raise your hand. A zero. 
Okay? Sisters and brothers, there's a lot going on out there that mainstream media that's controlled by big corporate interests are not interested in making it easy for people like us to find out that people like us across the country are doing things and everybody just isn't taking it. And as we know more about these kinds of fights and actually some significant wins, it can give us hope that, well, maybe we can turn this around and it's not all gloom and doom and being hopeless. Okay? In, in Connecticut, Working people, organized labor, and the community came together in one paid sick leave statewide. Hundreds of thousands of people now have paid sick leave there. So when your kid is sick and you don't make a lot of money and your employer won't give it to you, they're required to do so by law. So you don't have to make a choice between, well, if I stay home with the kids, we may not have enough money to eat. And they won that. We won the same thing in Seattle here. Uh, in 2012, and 190,000 people in the city now have paid sick leave that didn't have it. They said it couldn't be done. We were told, oh my gosh, the economy is going to collapse if we do this. And I have noticed so far that the economy has not collapsed in the city of Seattle. It got real close, but we managed to hold it off, and it's not, you know, it didn't, didn't completely melt down. Right? The scare tactics that they try and tell us about if we fight for positive change, somehow it's going to backfire and make it worse are just lies lies and damn lies. And we can't believe them. We need to look to see not only what folks are doing here, but across the country. Walmart. Here's the biggest corporation in the world. They're making tons of money. What do they do as part of their business practice? When you apply for a job in many states at Walmart, they give you an application to apply for state Medicaid, which is a government subsidized and funded health plan rather than them providing it themselves, right? And then they turn around and give money to right-wing politicians who bash away at people who sign up for Medicaid and say, we have got to deal with these lazy takers who won't go out and do the right thing. Well, last year, the day after Thanksgiving, workers walked out of 1,500 Walmarts across the country demanding an increase in pay. This is a long fight, but it's also part of the working people and the community coming together and saying, we don't have to take this anymore. In 2012, this is very dear to my heart because this is about poor kids and working class kids reaching for their dreams. They wanted to double the interest rates on the student loans from 3.4 to 6.8%. Okay, remember this? You're nodding your head, yeah. The big banks were getting 0% loans from the Federal Reserve and they want the legal right to raise the loans that they're giving to the working class and poor kids from 3.4 to 6.8 while they're already a trillion bucks in the hole. I mean, really? Is this the America that you want to live in? I don't want to live in a country like this. I want this changed because this touches me very deeply because I got a chance to reach for my dreams. My country gave me a chance, but it was because people fought for it that I got that chance and now they're trying to steal it away. And you know what happened in 2012? Students across the country got into the streets, raised hell. They beat on Congress so hard that Congress did not double the rates. Let's hear it for our young people and our students, okay? Yeah. Okay. How many of you knew this story? Okay, this was huge. This was huge. The next year they lost and they did double the rates. Okay, so the, but the fight's not over. And I want to just talk for a minute about immigration, okay? Does anybody know how many of the Wall Street executives who wrecked the economy in 2008 were undocumented workers from Mexico? Now, now I don't know why this is so funny. This, this is a very serious lecture. Does anybody know what the answer is? The answer is zero. Okay, the answer is actually zero. I checked. Okay. The National Security Agency did the research for me because they know everything about everybody now because they're listening in on everything. Okay. The answer is actually zero. But if I was a space alien from Mars and I was monitoring radio and TV broadcasts in the United States, you'd think it was about 50%. And I'm here to tell you that if we fall into the trap of saying the reason that things are screwed up around here and times are tough and things are hard is because we got some poor folks who were desperate and they're working under the table, busting dishes at a restaurant down the street from, from where I live. If that's the reason that America is turning into what it is, is because of them, we got it completely wrong. 
And that is people can disagree about how we fix immigration, but we can't fall into the trap of going, it's their fault. They have nothing to do with spending $90 million to try and buy elections or ruling that people don't have the right to vote or making it more difficult for our kids to be able to afford college. They have nothing to do with that at all. But it is a way to get us fighting amongst ourselves so that we don't focus on the great task of taking our democracy back and restoring a broadly shared prosperity. So what can we do? I'm here because I'm, I'm trying to help get a U.S. constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics and repeal the ridiculous idea that corporations are legal persons protected by the U.S. Constitution. There's not one word in the Constitution about corporations at all. Okay? Sixteen states have passed through varying legal means, either through their legislatures or votes of the people, calling for a constitutional amendment to essentially repeal the idea that free speech is equal to money and that you should be able to spend as much money as you want and that our government does not have the legal right to monitor and re re mandatory reporting and also to limit the amount of money that people can give in elections so that we don't have the kind of bought elections that we had in 1896 and what they're trying to do now. Okay. Sixteen states have done it. There have been over 400 municipalities to it. It's called Initiative 1329. It's being pushed by an organization called WAMEND. And we're working hard to get enough signatures to get an initiative on the ballot so that we can have a vote in November so that we can be another one of the states calling for let's have a constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics and restore some sense that we are once again going to be a government of, by, and for the people. So let me, let me finish with, with a quote. This is the only quote that's mine. I don't have the nerve to actually put my name on the quote and show it up on the screen. The ultimate test of a person, of a movement, and a people is not whether or not we get knocked down. It is what do we do when we get up. Are we stronger? Are we smarter? Are we more determined? And are we more united? This is always our choice. And I say to everybody in this room, you as individuals and us collectively in our diverse communities, get to make that choice of are we going to stand up, get stronger, smarter, more determined, and more united. And if we do, like our ancestors showed so many years before, they did it, we can do it too. Let's take our country back so that once again, the future is going to get brighter, not only for ourselves, but for the young people that we love and care about. Thank you very, very much. Wow, there's a, there's a broad question. Um, the place that I'm at at this point in time is that we have multiple movements in this country that are fighting for some peace of a better future. Organized labor's doing it, the environmentalists are doing it, women's groups are doing it, gays and lesbians are doing it, students are doing it, seniors are doing it, immigrant rights are doing it, probably leaving out some groups, not meaning to offend anybody. But there are other movements that are all sort of trying to work for some piece of, of a, better, a better future. And I argue that the totality of our efforts is less than the sum of our parts. And what I mean by that is that our efforts, you know, they should be additive so that we get more out of it rather than less. But because we're split up and we're not united in a long-term strategic way around a common vision that's anchored in values, uh, that uh, it's hard for us to move forward. And so part of what I'm going out and doing is talking to all sorts of groups and saying, we're all getting pushed back, we're all getting ripped off. And that is our common ground. So let's sit down and break bread with each other, figuratively and literally, and talk about how we work together more strategically so that we can form a positive, you know, what is that positive vision that we're fighting for? Because too many of us, in some ways, are sort of fighting for a piece of it, or we're fighting to avoid things getting worse. And um, 
and, and the, the critical role of vision anchored in values. I, I do a lot of work with unions, and I was talking to a union leader recently that I'm helping their union sort of rethink about who they are and how they approach things. And we were talking about the critical importance of talking to people's hearts before we talk to the head. And he said, well, you know, but a lot of my members are really into it. They got all these ideas. And I said, he said, so give me your best example. And I said, you heard of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King? And he goes, yeah, because there's a picture of him up on his wall, right, in his office, right? And he kind of goes, well, what kind of a question was that? I said, well, just checking if you knew who he was. And he said, yeah. And I said, do you remember his 16-point political program? And he goes, no. I said, do you remember this? I have a dream that someday the descendants of slave owners will walk hand in hand through the red hills of Georgia with the descendants of slaves on the long road to a more beloved and blessed community? And it goes, you made your point. And that our side, I think, part of the discussions we need to have is not these, just these immediate fights, but also what is that unifying, inspiring vision of what we're fighting for, where we're trying to get to, and what are the values that underlie that? And I would argue that our side is not very good at that yet. And that because we're not, it's harder for us to build the unity and the power we need to win big like our ancestors did at different points in the past. They didn't win everything, but they made things qualitatively better than they were. I would prefer this not be me trying to be the fount the fount of all knowledge and wisdom because I am not. Uh, I've got my own ideas, but I think it's important to ask others. I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you a short answer to that is, is that uh, even if one were to accept your argument and then someone to say, okay, describe socialism to me. Are you talking about Stalinist Russia or are you talking about communist China or are you talking about Albania or, well, and then when you, when you push somebody very far and go, well, would you describe what this looks like and be somewhat concrete about it so I can decide whether I agree with you or not, uh, it gets pretty mushy pretty fast. And so the reason that I'm wanting to get people into rooms talking to each other is to start talking about, well, what is your vision for a better world? What does that look like in real terms? And let's have a conversation and see how much we agree. And the label we may put to it, maybe socialism, it may be something else, I don't know. But unless we have that dialogue amongst ourselves, then it will be a, a slogan that goes, ooh, I don't know, or yeah, I kind of like that, but I'm really not sure what that concretely means. That, that's, that's part of the challenge. But I think I'd rather open this up to other folks' ideas. There is a, there is a mentality in the country, and it's not held by everyone, but it is, I call the, uh, the great white knight theory. We keep waiting for the great white knight to show up to save us, and in this case, it's the great black knight that shows up to save us. And we're always disappointed because no person is going to save us. There is no Messiah, no offense here, on the political scene that is ever going to do that. And I say, we, we have to act as if we are the people we have been waiting for. And we have to act like we are the ones who are capable of changing the course of history and believe that we are actually capable of doing that. That's why this history is so important is because if I had my slideshow up there, you see my grandparents, they're just the salt of the earth, working class people, poorly educated in school, but they understood that if you don't stand up and push, we're gonna get run over, okay? And I don't care how much education you have, if you learn that and you stand up and you say, who am I gonna unite with? So an example being, uh, Tom and I are on the exec executive board of a group called the Puget Sound Advocates for Retirement Action which is an intergenerational group. Uh, we've got about 1,300 members and we work on retirement issues, but we're also involved in the broad economic, social justice, and environmental health issues sort of in aggregate. And this Saturday, we're bringing together about 40 different organizations, leaders from 40 different organizations from labor, communities of color, immigrant rights, women, gays and lesbians, students, seniors, and there's one other movement I'm not thinking of here at the moment. We're bringing together 40 different organizations and having a conversation about what is our common ground? What do we share in common here? Do we share in common that the future looks like it's getting grimmer? Yes. 
Do we share common values? Well, we're going to find out. And do we share some level of vision about what we're fighting for, not just what we're fighting to prevent? And to start that kind of a conversation and then say, where do we go from here? Because there are going to be groups there that have never talked to each other before, ever. And, uh, and we have to overcome that. And I jokingly refer to it as the, what's called the pity party where we sit around and go, oh God, ain't it awful, and those people are doing all this terrible, crappy stuff to us, and, and woe is us, and I say, let's do that for 10 minutes, we'll get it out of our system, we'll be therapeutic here and get it out of our system, and then talk about what are we going to do to organize ourselves more effectively so that we can change the course of what is happening here. And, and stay away from, except for analytic purposes, how is this thing broken, but don't keep it becomes like a repetitive treadmill of, oh my God, and now they're doing this, and yeah, okay, fine, and what are we going to do? And so I say to everybody, looking at everybody, individually and collectively, what are we going to do? What are you going to do to help us figure this out? Because you can already see where, where it's headed unless we change it. That's the, that's the challenge, I think. I mean, it's easier said than done. It's sort of hard to start out by saying, I know you've never been involved politically before, but are you willing to get your skull fractured on Saturday when we go down here to, to stand up for X? Well, you know, you'd look at me like, who is this wing nut like? Get out of my face. Adios, amigo. Right? But if I said to you, are you worried about the future for the young people that you love and care about? Are you? You know? Would you like to figure out a way that we can be more effective so that over time the future is going to get brighter? Yeah? Well, as, as we have those kinds of conversations, a very heart-to-heart -heart conversation about, are you worried about the young people you know and how it's going to turn out for them? Yeah. I don't know anybody who's apathetic about that, okay? Because we love our young people. And so then the question is, with each individual, can I get you involved a little bit? And can I help you get involved a little bit more and draw people back draw people into action who've never been there before, or maybe were in the past, but need to again. And that's why I, I, that, that sort of joke I made of, are you ready to go home tonight and tell the young people that you know and love that it's, it's really screwed up and it's gonna get worse and I don't care? Nobody's ever willing to do that. So it, it's how do we draw people into motion again? The work that I've been doing, I have spent a lot of time learning and really understanding my own family history. And without sounding corny, I, I am trying to channel my grandparents and channel my parents because they inspired me because they were just regular old ordinary, so-called ordinary people who never ever gave up. And no matter how hard it was, they got up the next day and went, I'm gonna do the best I possibly can. So I. I, I do other kinds of speeches and workshops and I tell the story about my grandfather dying an unemployed auto worker in 1932 who was denied health care. Well, if you want to know one of the reasons our family is kind of pretty fierce on universal health care is because a member of our family died being denied health care in 1932 and hopefully you never forget that for 10 generations because that's barbarism, right? Well, every time I tell that story and I've told it like 100 times in front of groups, I always get, I almost always get choked up and I get tears in my eyes and I have to stop and compose myself because I never met the guy because he was dead before I was born, but I heard from my parents, what was that like? And so it's sort of like, I don't want this to happen to anybody. So I, I get in touch with the pain of the people, and I don't, it, sound, it can sound corny, but it's not at all. I get in touch with, this is real life, these are real people, my people are real, your people are real. And there's pain out in the audience. Every audience that I talk to, there's pain because there's people whose kids had to move back home because they can't make it or, you know, I mean, a friend of ours, you know, lost her house because they got laid off. And, you know, we, we paid their mortgage for a year and we finally let them go and said, we can't keep doing this and had to let them lose their house, you know. And it's like, I'm looking in the mirror going, yeah, what kind of a person are you anyway? Because we probably could have kept doing it for two more years, but... You know, was that the right thing to do? I don't know. Well, we did it, finally. Now, I'm not looking for a round of applause or sympathy.
And so this, uh, this is work talking, I'm talking from the heart when I'm up there, not from the head. And that I think that the more we talk from our hearts as the opener, then we talk from our heads after we've established a human connection in the room. To respond to you, um, and I say this respectfully, you said something like the American people have nothing in common. I, I except, I can't remember I, the, okay. And, and, and that is a feeling and a belief that may or may not be empirically true. And I think it's important for us to check what we believe to be true with what empirical evidence we have to support our beliefs. And I, the reason I say that is I've done 140 of these with 10,000 people in the audiences in the last two and a half years from Miami, Florida to Vancouver to San Diego to Pittsburgh and places in between. And every one of those audiences is filled with people who by, I ask them those questions at the start and get a conversation started. And overwhelmingly, that, well, that 10,000 pool, and I'm not saying it's a representative sample of the whole country, the vast majority of them feel like the future is being stolen from the young people that they love and care about. They really don't like it. They want to shift in direction, and they're struggling to figure out what to do. That is a lot of common ground that is foundational to achieving a fundamental shift. And so that if we don't believe that, then it is hopeless. And that uh, I, I have people come up to me after virtually every one of my speeches or workshops and go, God, you've given me renewed hope that we can actually do this. Well, and uh, my wife jokingly calls me an economic justice evangelist and I finally <laughs> said, okay, that's what I'm doing. I'm bringing the good news that this is not hopeless and our history shows us that our ancestors could do it, and so can we. And how we do it this time around, it's going to be tough, it's not going to be easy, and it's going to be complicated, and it's going to be messy, but we can't give up because otherwise then we've got to give up on the young people we care about.